When we started for our drive, the sun was shining brightly on Munich, and the air was full of the joyousness of early summer. Just as we were about to depart, Herr Derbruck, the maître de hôtel of the Quatre Saisons, where I was staying, came down, bareheaded to the carriage, and, after wishing me a pleasant drive, said to the coachman, still holding his hand on the handle of the carriage door, Remember, you are back by nightfall. The sky looks bright, but there is a shiver in the north wind that says there may be a sudden storm. But I'm sure you will not be late, here he smiled and added, for you know what night it is. Johann answered with an emphatic, Ja, mein Herr, and, touching his hat, drove off quickly. When we had cleared the town, I said, after signaling to him to stop, Tell me, Johann, what is tonight? He crossed himself as he answered laconically, Valprugus knocked. Then he took out his watch, a great old-fashioned silver thing as big as a turnip, and looked at it, with his eyebrows gathered together and a little impatient shrug of his shoulders. I realized this was his way of respectfully protesting against the unnecessary delay and sank back in the carriage, merely motioning him to proceed. He started off rapidly, as if to make up for lost time. Every now and then the horses seemed to throw up their heads and sniff the air suspiciously. On such occasions I often looked round in alarm. The road was pretty bleak, for we were traversing a sort of high, windswept plateau. As we drove, I saw a road that looked but little used and which seemed to dip through a little, winding valley. It looked so inviting that, even at the risk of offending him, I called Johann to stop, and when he had pulled up I told him I would like to drive down that road. He made all sorts of excuses and frequently crossed himself as he spoke. This somewhat piqued my curiosity, so I asked him various questions. He answered fencingly and repeatedly looked at his watch in protest. Finally, I said, Well, Johann, I want to go down this road. I shall not ask you to come unless you like, but tell me why you do not like to go. That is all I ask. For answer, he seemed to throw himself off the box, so quickly did he reach the ground. Then he stretched out his hands appealingly to me and implored me not to go. There was just enough of English mixed with the German for me to understand the drift of his talk. He seemed always just about to tell me something, the very idea with, of which evidently frightened him. But each time he pulled himself up, saying as he crossed himself, Valprug is knocked! I tried to argue with him, but it was difficult to argue with a man when I did not know his language. The advantage certainly rested with him, for although he began to speak in English, of a very crude and broken kind, he always got excited and broke into his native tongue, and every time he did so, he looked at his watch. Then the horses became restless and sniffed the air. At this he grew very pale, and looking around in a frightened way, he suddenly jumped forward, took them by the bridles, and led them on some twenty feet. I followed and asked why he had done this. For answer, he crossed himself, pointed to the spot we had left, and drew his carriage in the direction of the other road, indicating a cross, and said, first in German, then in English, Buried him. Him what killed himself. I remembered the old custom of burying suicides at crossroads. Ah, I see, a suicide. How interesting. But for the life of me, I could not make out why the horses were frightened. Whilst we were talking, we heard a sort of sound between a yelp and a bark. It was far away, but the horses got very restless, and it took Johann all his time to quiet them. He was pale and said, It sounds like a wolf, but yet there are no wolves here now. No, I said, questioning him. Isn't it long since the wolves were so near the city? Long, long, he answered, in the spring and summer. But with the snow, the wolves have been here not so long. Whilst he was petting the horses and trying to quiet them, dark clouds drifted rapidly across the sky. The sunshine passed away, and a breath of cold wind seemed to drift past us. It was only a breath, however, and more in the nature of a warning than a fact, for the sun came out brightly again. Johann looked under his lifted hand at the horizon and said, The storm of snow, he comes before long time. Then he looked at his watch again, and, straight away holding his reins firmly, for the horses were pawing the ground restlessly and shaking their heads, 
He climbed to his box as though the time had come for proceeding on our journey. I felt a little obstinate and did not at once get into the carriage. Tell me, I said, about this place where the road leads, and I pointed down. Again he crossed himself and mumbled a prayer before he answered, It is unholy. What is unholy? I inquired. Here he crossed himself. Those who were left fled away to other places where the living lived and the dead were dead and not not something it seemed as if his imagination had got hold of him and he ended in a perfect paroxysm of fear white-faced perspiring trembling and looking around him as if expecting that some dreadful presence would manifest itself there in the bright sunshine on the open plain finally in an agony of desperation he cried valpurgis knocked and pointed to the carriage for me to get in. All my English blood rose at this, and standing back, I said, You are afraid, Johann, you are afraid. I took from the seat my oak walking stick, which I always carry on my holiday excursions, and closed the door, pointing back to Munich, and said, Go home, Johann. Valpurgis Nacht doesn't concern Englishmen. The horses were now more restive than ever, and Johann was trying to hold them in while excitedly imploring me to not do anything foolish. He went slowly along the road for a while. Then there came over the crest of the hill a man tall and thin, but I found that he, too, was gone. With a light heart, I turned down the side road through the deepening valley to which Johann had objected. But I did not notice this particularly till, on turning a bend in the road, I came upon a scattered fringe of wood. It struck me that it was considerably colder than it had been at the commencement of my walk. A sort of sighing sound seemed to be around me, with now and then a high overhead sort of muffled roar. There were signs of a coming storm in some lofty stratum of the air. They were accompanied by a sort of faraway rushing sound, through which seemed to come at intervals that mysterious cry which the driver had said came from a wolf. I had said I would see the deserted village, so on I went, and presently came on a wide stretch of open country, shut in by hills all around. I followed with my eye the winding of the road, and saw that it curved close to one of the densest of these clumps, and was lost behind it. As I looked, there came a cold shiver in the air, and the snow began to fall. Darker and darker grew the sky, and faster and heavier fell the snow till the earth before and around me was a glistening white carpet, the further edge of which was lost in misty vagueness. Every now and then the heavens were torn asunder by a vivid lightning, and in the flashes I could see ahead me the great mass of trees, chiefly yew and cypress, all heavily coated with snow. I was soon amongst the shelter of the trees, and there, in comparative silence, I could hear the rush of the wind high overhead. By and by, the storm seemed to be passing away, and now only came in fierce puffs or blasts. At such moments, the weird sound of the wolf appeared to be echoed by many similar sounds around me. Now and again, through the black mass of drifting cloud, came a straggling ray of moonlight which lit up the expanse and showed me that I was at the edge of a dense mass of cypress and yew trees. As the snow had ceased to fall, I walked out from the shelter and began to investigate more closely. But this was only momentarily, for suddenly the moonlight broke through the clouds, showing me that I was in a graveyard, and that the square object before me was a great massive tomb of marble, as white as the snow that lay on and all around it. With the moonlight there came a fierce sigh of the storm, which appeared to resume its course with a long, low howl, as of many dogs or wolves. While the flood of moonlight still fell on the marble tomb, the storm gave further evidence of renewing, as though it was returning on its track. I walked around it and read over the Doric door in German, Countess Dolingen of Graz, in Styria, sought and found death, 1801. On the top of the tomb, seemingly driven through the solid marble, for the structure was composed of a few vast blocks of the stone, was a great iron spike or stake. On going to the back, I saw engraven in great Russian letters, 
The dead travel fast. There was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing that it gave me a turn and made me feel quite faint. Here a thought struck me, which came under almost mysterious circumstances and with a terrible shock. This was Walpurgis Night. Walpurgis Night when, according to the belief of millions of people, the devil was abroad. When the graves were opened and the dead came forth and walked, this is where the suicide lay and this was the place where I was alone unmanned, shivering with cold in a shroud of sorrow with a wild storm gathering again upon me. And this time the storm bore on its icy wings not snow, but great hailstones which drove with such violence that they might have come from the thongs of Belieric slingers. Hailstones that beat down leaf and branch and made the shelter of the cypresses of no more avail than though their stems were standing corn. The shelter of even a tomb was welcome in that pitiless tempest. Now I was about to enter it when there came a flash of forked lightning that lit up the whole expanse of the heavens. Just then there came another blinding flash which seemed to strike the iron stake that surmounted the tomb and to bore through the earth, blasting and crumbling the marble as in a burst of flame. The last thing I heard was this mingling of dreadful sound as again I was seized in the giant grasp and dragged away, while the hailstones beat on me, and the air seemed reverberant with the howling of wolves. The last sight that I remembered was a vague, white, moving mass, as if all the graves around me had sent out the phantoms of their sheeted dead, and that they were closing in on me through the white cloudiness of the driving hail. Gradually there came a sort of vague beginning of consciousness. Then a sense of weariness that was dreadful, for some heavy weight on my chest made it difficult for me to breathe. This period of semi-lethargy seemed to remain a long time, and as it faded away I must have slept or swooned. Then came a sort of loathing, like the first stage of seasickness, and a wild desire to be free from something, I knew not what. A vast stillness enveloped me, as though all the world were asleep or dead, only broken by the low panting of some animal close to me. The reply rang out hurriedly, No, no, come away, quick, quick! The answer came variously and all indefinitely, as though the men were moved by some common impulse to speak, yet were restrained by some common fear from giving their thoughts. Indeed, gibbered one whose wits had plainly given out for the moment. A wolf, and yet not a wolf, another put in shudderingly. No use trying for him without the sacred bullet, a third remarked in a more ordinary manner. Service right for coming out on this night. See, comrades, the wolf has been lying on him and keeping his blood warm. The officer looked at my throat and replied, He is all right, the skin is not pierced. The young officer answered calmly, I said a dog. Dog, there came the calm voice of the young officer. A dog, I said. Here we came across a stray carriage, into which I was lifted, and it was driven off to the Croix Saison, the young officer accompanying me, whilst a trooper followed with his horse, and the others rode off to their barracks. When we arrived, Hal Delbruck rushed so quickly down the steps to meet me, that it was apparent that he had been watching within. The officer saluted me and was turning to withdraw, when I recognized his purpose and insisted that he should come to my room, at which ambiguous utterance at the Matisse de Hotel smiled, while the officer pleaded duty and withdrew. But Herr Delbruck, I inquired, how and why was it that the soldier searched for me? He shrugged his shoulders as if in depreciation of his own deed as he replied, I was so fortunate as to obtain leave from the commander of the regiment in which I served to ask for volunteers. But how did you know I was lost? I asked. The driver came hither with the remains of his carriage, which had been upset when the horses ran away. But surely you would not send a search party of soldiers merely on this account? Oh, no, he answered. But even before the coachman arrived, I had this telegram from the boyar whose guests you are. And then he took from his pocket a telegram which he handed me, and I read, Eastritz, be careful of my guest, 
His safety is most precious to me. I answer your zeal with my fortune. Dracula. As I held the telegram in my hand, the room seemed to whirl around me, and if the attentive Machi de Hotel had not caught me, I think I should have fallen. There was something so strange in all of this, something so weird and impossible to imagine that there grew on me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces, the mere vague ideal of which seemed in a way to paralyze me. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the snow sleep and the jaws of the wolf. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.